there's three words on the stone that we uh, put on our son's grave. There's a there's a marble stone on his grave. We've been carved into it with his name and dates. There's three words. Jesus is worthy. And for Louise and I, that was the major takeaway. We want to buy something in a box and unpack it and have it ready to go. And we want to skip the step of seeking the Holy Spirit for what we should do and really getting to know the people and their culture. But after they did not beat me as much as they used to before the letters began arriving. Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of our sacrifice. And he's worthy of our efforts to spread his glory and the good news of the gospel all over the world. We'll learn more about that call and about how Christians are answering it this week on VOM Radio as we talk to a Christian worker training church planters and evangelists all over the world. We're also going to talk about how you can make a real and practical difference in the lives of our Christian brothers and sisters held in prison for their faith. Jesus is worthy. Welcome to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome back to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. It's great to have you with us this week on VOM Radio. Uh, We're privileged to be joined in the studio today by Brian and Louise Hogan. Uh, Brian and Louise were part of the church planting team that planted the church in an isolated city in Mongolia. And if you were with us last week, you heard them talk about uh, planting that church, some of the challenges that they faced, uh, including the loss of their own son in Mongolia, but you also heard that even amidst those challenges, God was faithful. Uh, He did amazing and miraculous things to see his church established in Mongolia. So last week, we talked about their experience there. Uh, This week, we're going to talk about some of the principles that they learned in that process, which uh, are principles that they now teach to church planters around the world. Uh, They literally travel to dozens of countries training church leaders, training pastors, training church planters to put into practice uh, the things that they learned seeing God work in planting the church in Mongolia. Uh, Brian is the author of a couple of books. Uh, They have some of the best titles around. Uh, One of his books is called There's a Sheep in My Bathtub. We talked last week about what that meant. Uh, The other is A to Z of Near-Death Adventures, or the subtitle 26 Ways Satan Tried to Kill Me. Uh, Brian, we're glad that Satan didn't succeed and you're with us today. Uh, Brian and Louise, welcome back to our studio and thank you for being with us. Thank you. As we transition into this uh, time of talking about church planning, I want to encourage our listeners, uh, after you listen to this episode, go back to vomradio.net and listen to to our conversation last week about uh, the church planting experience in Mongolia, about the challenges, uh, about the faithfulness of God. Uh, It is an exciting and inspiring conversation, uh, and I hope that uh, you'll go back and listen to that. Brian, you're involved now in in church planting work and even more in training church planters. Um, One of the things you said this morning as you spoke in our VOM chapel service was uh, about stripping away, stripping it down to the basics. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's the things that we as Americans say, well, that's church. Uh, talk a little bit about that and how those things have come to mean church to us, but how they don't necessarily translate into Mongolian or Sudanese right. or one of the other places where you work. You said earlier, it seems like so much happens if the missionary can manage to get out of the way sometimes. And I just thought that's absolutely what we do as we go out and train new church planters is we're uh, teaching them what to leave behind. They, They have this huge unlearning process because what we've experienced as church, it's really good, but it's for this culture. 
it's developed in this culture. And actually, this culture, our own culture is in flux. And if we don't explore new wineskins, new ways of containing what God is doing, we're going to leave a lot of people on the outside who will never appreciate what we do on Sunday mornings. So that that's an apostolic, missionary, church planning kind of point of view on what's going on. But in talking about taking it to others, the most essential thing is to almost completely empty out the package. We call it the heavy package of how we do church. Uh, seminaries and uh, congregations sitting in rows and, and special buildings that meet on special days led by special men with special offerings taken and everything else. Everything that, that kind of means church to us. Song books and and empty out all of that and go back to the New Testament. Use the New Testament as a filter. If we don't see it there, we're not going to institute it on the nations. They don't need a potted palm tree dragged laboriously and planted in their soil. They need a seed that'll grow in that soil, that'll fit those environments, that the the local believers and the Holy Spirit conspire together to grow this beautiful new plant that's indigenous. That's a word that means it fits in the heart language and heart culture of the people. And that, because we're taking something simple, any believer inhabited by the Holy Spirit is a potential church planter. Every single one can start new fellowships among family and friends in other places, and they can lead these fellowships. We keep it really simple, and we trust the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believers. Otherwise, you never release anybody, and, and churches don't grow and multiply. So give me an example of something we mm-hmm. would see in a Mongolian church. If we went to worship with our Mongolian family, that would just be like, why are they doing that to us as Americans? Okay, well, um, a Mongolian uh, church meeting in an apartment, first of all, you'd see people sitting around in a circle. We, we kept it to 12. That seemed to be a good number where everybody would participate. Nobody fades into the background. And everybody's active and participating in every part of it. What happens there? Everything that happens in your church on Sunday morning. Okay, maybe the choir doesn't get up to sing, but there's praise and worship, and there's the word, and there's prayer. One of the things I love about the Mongolian church is that they're not afraid to sing solos. So in, <laughs> in even in normal life, you're watching a television, or like a, a, it was a um, TV interview. Yeah, TV interview, and the guy starts singing a song about his mother. And the interviewer just lets him sing the song, wow. and it's all part of. <laughs> so that translates into the church as well. Uh-huh. So if a person comes and they have a song, they're just going to sing it, and, and and they're fine to sing it alone. <laughs> and you're you're actually seeing what Paul described in Corinthians fourteen twenty six when he says, "What what is it then, brothers? When you come together, one has a song, one has a word, one has an encouragement, but everybody's doing everything for the building up of the body of Christ." It's not I'm not using my gifts to build me up. They're building you up. And if you don't participate, I'm not going to get built up. And so you'll see that. You'll see them um, just bringing a little bit of the word. Something in the beginning, it was something we taught the leaders and they took to all the churches. But it'd be short and it'd be small and be focused on obeying Jesus. And they'd share it in a way that everybody could participate. So maybe they say the verse or whatever it is three or four times. And then everybody bows their head and waits for the Holy Spirit to reveal something to them about this verse. And then everybody shares what they got. Or maybe they act it out. If it's a story of Jesus, they'll just act it out and have drama. And everybody participates. And then they talk about what they learned from this. And uh, so it was absolutely fantastic to see them worshiping, praying, giving. And the giving wasn't necessarily a plate being passed around the living room. That'd be a little odd, right? They were looking for ways to step out and obey uh, Jesus's instruction to be generous givers. And most of the time, that was neighbors. That was people they knew were in need. That was things they could do together as a group. They didn't see it as necessarily an individualistic command. It's like, what can we do to obey Jesus? Which is something I think the American church um, asks themselves too infrequently. It's all about, oh, yeah, these are the promises and these are the commands, and they're all for me, you know? And uh, the, the whole uh, idea of what can we as the church, as this gathering of believers around Jesus do was, I think, one of the distinctives there. They didn't have a whole lot of money, but giving is still a command. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> the gifts often were very interesting. A lot of times we would get um, uh, cured skins, marmot skins. Marmot skins. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, this is what they had, so right. they gave it. This is my gift to the Lord. Oh. I knew a guy, all he had was a gun and bullets, and he went out and shot marmots and did all the tanning and everything and then tied up those skins and brought them in and set them at the elders' feet. Wow. 
<laughs> Our American churches would freak out a little bit if someone did that. It's like, what are we going to do with those? I guess we don't get the animal rights uh, activists coming to church here now. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit, uh, because what you're doing now is training church planners around the world, yes. including hostile and restricted nations. So what's different or what's the same when you go into a nation where you know these church planners could be persecuted, they could be arrested, they could be killed. Uh, how does that affect your training process? Well, uh, one thing I have to say right off the bat is um, as far as fears of persecution, I almost never see it in the places where it actually happens. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I have Americans saying, oh, but what if, what if this, what if that? My students who are from the West will will have these concerns and concerns with their family. And they, are they rational? Are they legitimate concerns? Yeah. But these guys who actually are going to face it, they're fearless. They just, they don't even care about that stuff. I remember one of our disciples in um, um, Malawi, I, I'll name the country, but I won't tell anything specific, but he had a church already that he had planted in an urban area. And it was, it was large and um, growing, and it fit kind of the model uh, that had been introduced there of the Western church. And this guy came to me and he says, if I understand this teaching correctly, um, if I really want to see daughter churches and granddaughter churches and great-granddaughter churches getting planted kind of out of control, it's probably not going to happen with the kind of complicated church that I've already got going. I said, yeah. And he goes, well, what should I do? And I said, well, I hesitate to say. <laughs> and he said, no, tell me. And I said, well, you should just give that one to somebody else. Take off. Don't tell anybody where you're going. And go to some out-of-the-way, completely unreached area get in a village there, get to know and love the people, learn their language, learn their culture, and start planting simple groups of disciples who are able to disciple others also, and you will see churches grow out of control. I didn't see this guy for another seven years. He came to another training just recently that I was doing in a neighboring country uh, on an island in Mozambique, and uh, he comes up to me and says, do you remember me? And I said, yeah, I didn't remember his name, but I remembered his face. And he goes, well, do you remember I asked you a question? You gave me a really hard answer. I said, yeah, sometimes I do that. I'm sorry. And he goes, no, no, I just went home and did it immediately after I left you. I said, what? And he goes, yeah, I gave my church away uh, to one of the guys who was working with me. I took off and I moved into a completely Muslim village. And we have dozens and dozens of churches now among a, a formerly unreached people group. Because I just did what you said, did, did what you taught wow. us. And, and I was just like, wow, yeah. And he's, you know, not only, this was the coolest thing I thought of all, but not only did he have the courage to go right in there, he was living two doors down from the mosque leader and everything, who ended up getting saved. But not only did he have that kind of courage, he had the courage to draw together a training school for new church planters and have it in the village. <laughs> so... It's like, you know, if he had been asking me to tell him, should I do these things, I would have quailed. But, but he didn't have that fear. He was looking to Jesus and saying, what next, God? You're listening to Todd Nettleton on the Voice of the Martyrs radio network. And so really the tools are the same, whether you're in a hostile and restricted nation whether you're in America, whether you're in Mongolia, wherever, uh, the tools are, are the ones that are in the New Testament. Yeah, they're, they're New Testament principles. There's a ton of methods out there, and you know I've got nothing but respect for a lot of them, but the fact is if you take a method to a brand new people group, I can guarantee it won't work because methods are specific, and you can learn from them, and you can adapt like crazy and maybe use some of what you learn, but you can't take evangelism explosion or G12 church or anything and apply it across the board and expect the same results that you got in Colombia or wherever it was developed. And that is just such a common, we want to buy something in a box and unpack it and have it ready to go. And we want to skip the step of seeking the Holy Spirit for what we should do and really getting to know the people in their culture and to find ways that don't violate that, but that God can work within that. And we really see things then explode and take off. As we finish up, I, I want to, you know, what Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Uh, the Mongolian church that you helped plant 
they're doing some pretty amazing things oh today. Gosh, yes. Tell us a little bit about where they are these years later. Well, look at the Voice of the Martyrs map, and <laughs> quite a bit of it uh, is where Mongolian missionaries are now. They uh, started a Mongolian missions training center in Erdnet, where we planted the church. It doesn't belong to the church that we planted, but they're the ones who asked for it because we planted an intensely missionary church. And... Um, so they train Mongolian missionaries from across the board, from all of the movements and the denominations and everything. They come to Erdnet, they receive training, and they go out to the nations. They've not only reached the tribes of Mongolia that are not the dominant people, the other tribes, but they've gone into Russia, China, North Korea, Afghanistan, Tibet, uh, all over the place, uh, even on ship ministries, like with Operation Mobilization and things like that. We've got Mongolians serving all over the world, and they're radical church planners. They think that's the core of missions, because that's what they experienced, and that's what turned their, their world upside down and inside out. And they are not willing that anybody should be unreached. The Mongolians feel like they have a mandate from God to take back the former lands of Chinggis Khan. Wow. So they are looking at what they formerly had conquered with violence and going in with the Prince of Peace. Amazing. Yeah. When you guys see that, do you just feel like how amazing is this that God let us be in on the oh ground floor of this amazing work? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I want to say two things about that. One is that uh, we feel like we got to live through a um, modern-day fulfillment of God's prophecy to Habakkuk. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed because I'm about to do something in your day that you wouldn't believe, even if I told you. And that's what happened in Mongolia. Mongolia now sends out more missionaries per Christian than any other nation on earth. And this is a people who not even one of them knew who Jesus Christ was at the end of 1989. It's just astounds Mind me. Mind blowing. Yeah. And um, the other thing that I wanted to say is there's three words on the stone that we uh, put on our son's grave. There's a there's a marble stone on his grave, a granite stone on his grave, and carved into it with his name and dates is three words. Jesus is worthy. And for Louise and I, that was the major takeaway that Jesus, the lamb who was slain, who purchased, according to the book of Revelation, purchased men for God with his blood from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, is worthy of whatever you or I could be asked to walk through to see that lamb receive the reward of his sufferings, the worship of the peoples of the earth. That's what God's unchanging purpose is. Uh, the, according to the book of Hebrews, the unchanging purpose of God is that all the families, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And until that happens, first, Jesus isn't coming back. <laughs> he's waiting for that. God's sworn on his own name he's going to do it. And he is so worthy of that worship that to this day, he's not getting 2,000 years after he asked us to join with him in this. He is still not getting it from the unreached and particularly the unengaged peoples of the world. And many of them, most of them are in these incredibly oppressive countries. Mongolia was so hostile to the gospel, there were no believers there at all. There was no suffering church. There was no nothing church. There was nothing. And so those kind of nations really are what's on our plate as Jesus's bride on this planet. And it's time that the lamb received the reward that he paid for. Amen. Thank you, Brian and Louise Hogan, for being our guests again this week. Uh, thank you for sharing the things you've learned. If you want to connect with Brian and Louise, you can online at cpcoaches.com. C like church, P like planting, coaches.com. So I encourage you to do that. Connect with them. Uh, you can order Brian's books from cpcoaches.com. If you look under resources, you can also order them from Amazon or uh, other Christian booksellers. Thank you again to Brian and Louise Hogan for being with us this week. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to transition now to talk a little bit about Christians in prison. And one of the things that we can do, uh, one of the things that Voice of the Martyrs has done from the very beginning of our ministry is connect Christians in America with our brothers and sisters who are in prison for their faith around the world in hostile and restricted nations. Uh, if you come to our headquarters here in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, we have a little museum area. We actually have a poster uh, that was sent out in the late 1960s that has the faces and names of prisoners in the old Soviet Union, 
Christian prisoners. So uh, our interest in prisoners goes back that far. Our interest in helping people know about them, uh, know their faces, know their names, be able to write a letter to them, uh, also goes back uh, really to the beginning, the very first days of our ministry. We're going to share a letter today from a a more recent Christian prisoner, and uh, he writes uh, about his time in prison, but the part I want you to hear, and in fact, I've been sharing this letter as I've spoken at VOM conferences around the country in the last 12 months, the part I want you to hear is about the importance of the letters that he received from Christians around the world. So I hope you'll enjoy uh, this letter. Uh, it's a letter written by Pastor Dmitry Shestikov from Uzbekistan. Uh, it's a letter read by one of our VOM contacts who speaks the Russian language. The letters that you wrote, that was fantastic because the prison was getting the sacks full of letters. And when another sack was carried in, everybody knew that all those letters were for Shostakov. The head guard was constantly yelling profanities for all the letters that were addressed to me. I remember very well what happened when the first sack of letters came. The head of security department called me in. He was in shock. I saw the letters scattered around his entire office. I myself was shocked. He was looking at the addresses of the senders, America, Australia. He yelled at me, who are these people? I said, these are my brothers and sisters. Why are they writing to you? I said, I don't know. They're praying for me. Tell them to stop writing. I said, how can I stop them? Give me their addresses so I could write them. He kept yelling at me for some time after this. They did not give me any letters to read. Since that time, when another sack of letters for me would come, they would call me in and yell at me. But after they did not beat me as much as they used to before the letters began arriving, they began speaking with me more politely. On rare occasions, they even addressed me formally, which was unheard of among the prisoners who were charged under the same article of the criminal law. What you do is a huge blessing for us. Thank you very much. There's a part of this letter that I hope you picked up on as he read. They would call me in and yell at me, but after that, they would not beat me as much. That's the testimony of Pastor Dmitry Shestikov, former prisoner for Christ in Uzbekistan. He never actually got to have the letters that came in for him. He never got to, you know, take them back to his cell and read them, but they made a difference. After the letters started coming, they would not beat me as much. You know, that's the same testimony that we heard uh, just a few weeks back on VOM Radio from Miriam and Marzia from Iran. They never got to actually see the letters. When they were released, the authorities said, yeah, we'll give you the letters now that you're released, but they never actually did it. But they testify to how their treatment changed. One of my favorite parts of their book, Captive in Iran, is where one of the prison officials takes them aside and says, do you know how much trouble you're causing for us? And, you know, these two Christian ladies look at him and say, listen, we're the ones in prison. How could we be causing trouble for you? And he says, do you know how much mail you're getting? And we have to read every single one of those letters. And so those letters that were coming into Miriam and Marzia, thousands of them, were being read by the prison guards. Who knows how many of those letters had passages of Scripture in them? How many of those letters talked about the family of God and how we're apart and how we're linked together? Who knows what the testimony was in those letters to those Iranian prison guards? When you write a letter, it makes a difference. We've heard from those who didn't get the letters. We've also heard from those who do get the letters. Uh, Eva Abdallah in Tanzania received boxes of mail from around the world. Sandal Bibi in Pakistan received thousands of letters uh, and was able to get them and have them with her. This is the power of letter writing. This is the power of the website that Voice of the Martyrs set up, prisoneralert.com where you go and compose letters to Christians in prison around the world, even if the letters don't get to them, even if they never see them, they do make a difference. They do make a difference in how they're treated by the prison authorities, by the guards, by the wardens, by others. They do make a difference when they get to court and stand in front of a judge because the judge knows this is a case that the world is watching. 
This is the purpose of PrisonerAlert.com is to enable you to write these letters because we do know that they make a difference. Pastor Dimitri says it. They would yell at me, but after the letters started arriving, they didn't beat me as much. When I've shared Pastor Dimitri's letter at our VOM conferences, I emphasized that part. After the letters started coming, they didn't beat me as much. You can compose a letter to a Christian in prison on PrisonerAlert.com in, in less than 10 minutes. You can choose the phrases and verses that you want to include. You hit print, and it comes out of your printer in the language of the prisoners. So under 10 minutes, you can compose one of these letters. Let me ask you a question. Uh, if I said, you know, I want 10 minutes of your day today, and in return for that 10 minutes, one of your Christian brothers and sisters in prison somewhere in the world will avoid a beating. How many of you would say, sure, you, you can have 10 minutes of my day if, if one of my brothers and sisters won't get beaten today? That's the power of PrisonerAlert.com. That's why we write these letters. There are currently prisoners on the site from Iran, Uzbekistan, China, Pakistan, and other nations. Your 10 minutes could make a difference in whether they are beaten or not beaten today. Uh, I think that brings it in very sharp focus why we set up PrisonerAlert.com, why you should go and write letters and put them in the mail to these Christian brothers and sisters, because it really does make a difference for them. Pastor Dimitri's testimony makes that very clear. It does make a difference. Go to PrisonerAlert.com, write a letter to a Christian in prison today. That wraps up our show for today. It's been great to have you with us. Uh, again, my thanks to Brian and Louise Hogan for sharing uh, about their church planting ministry. Uh, my thanks to Dmitry Shestikov, though he probably won't hear this broadcast, uh, for sharing his heart after being a prisoner for Christ in Uzbekistan. Uh, and thank you for being with us today and listening to us. You can listen to this interview again uh, you can share it with your friends from our website, vomradio.net, vomradio.net. Uh, listen to this interview. Listen to past episodes of the program. You can listen to Brian and Louise's interview from a week ago. If you have a question or a comment, you can also submit it on vomradio.net, or you can call us toll-free 1-800-757-5069. That's 1-800-757-5069. Ask us a question, give us a comment, give your take on one of the topics that we've discussed this week. We would love to hear from you, again, online at vomradio.net or by phone, 1-800-757-5069. We'd love to connect with you on Twitter as well. If you tweet about this episode, please use the hashtag VOMRadio, and you can follow us at VOM underscore USA. The Bible tells us to remember those in bonds as if we were bound with them. We do that every single week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.